Hello, Father Larry, back for chapter two now of John's Gospel. So uh, let's get our bearings. Okay, we're in Cana, and we're going to have the wedding feast of Cana, and then the cleansing of the temple are the two major events that occur in chapter two. Let's uh, start with a prayer. Uh, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let's take a moment to recollect ourselves in the presence of Almighty God and invite the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. St. John, pray for us. St. Jerome, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So we're in Cana, which is about nine miles north of Nazareth in Galilee. Let's go ahead and read the first 11 verses of this wedding feast. On the third day, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the marriage with his disciples. When the wine failed, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, O woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now six stone jars were standing there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the steward of the feast. So they took it. When the steward of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. All right. Let's uh, start off by recollecting chapter 1. And there's a certain chronological context that we have to uh, get clear on. You had seven days now leading up to this wedding feast because John signaled to us uh, kind of the chronology in chapter one. You see three repetitions of this next day, on the next day, on the next day. And then he begins chapter two with on the third day. So if you count up these days in the ministry of Jesus, you count seven days. Okay, so there's both a seventh day and uh, this reference to the third day, both of these we have to look at, starting with the seventh day. What is the seventh, <coughs> seventh day? We know what that is. It's the Sabbath. Okay. God instructed the Israelites in Exodus chapter 19 to keep the Sabbath holy. Okay. It's part of the Ten Commandments. Um, but really, it goes all the way back to creation. Right, so the first creation account uh, at the beginning of chapter 2 of Genesis uh, is when God rests on the seventh day. So for the Jews, I mean, the Sabbath is everything. It's, it's, it's huge for them. Um, and really, this is long before there was an Israel, long before the call of Abram. Uh, the whole of the human race ultimately is called to the Sabbath day rest. So this isn't just a Jewish thing now. This is something universal. And what we see in the seventh day is a marriage. There's a spousal nuptial dimension uh, to the seventh day of Sabbath rest. There was an intimacy that Adam and Eve enjoyed in the garden, walking in the cool of the day. This is what the rabbis saw. And uh, we need to take this very seriously, um, that there's a spousal nuptial dimension to this Sabbath, notion of the Sabbath. Um, so more on that to come. 
But uh, just by way of introduction, um, we need to think of um, Genesis uh, 1 to 3. When we uh, uh, consider this whole thing, because John certainly is and wants us to make that connection. All right. So when he, for instance, refer addresses his mother as woman, Gune, okay, this is a reference to the woman in Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelion, the first announcement of a gospel, okay, when God says, when he curses the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. All right, so who is this woman? Who is this singular woman who is at enmity with the devil? Well, we know who it is. It's the Blessed Mother. That's why she's uh, depicted in statues and paintings standing on the serpent, okay? Calling to my Genesis 3.15 here. Um, she's at enmity. She is full of grace. Grazia plena. K. Carry tomine, okay? She is filled to the brim, just like these stone water jars are going to be filled to the brim. Uh, she's full to the brim. The rest of us are like leaky buckets. We got a hole in the bucket. Uh, the Blessed Mother does not. So, so certainly, um, we're seeing here a new Adam in our Lord. And he is, uh, this Adam of the Old Testament was a mere type of, pointing to Christ. That's what Paul says uh, in referring to Adam. He says the first man was a type of the one who was to come. So Adam who was a type of Christ. Um, a type is something that points to a greater fulfillment. Uh, as Paul's going to say later in 1 Corinthians 15, in talking about the resurrection, the first man was from the dust. Okay, It was of the earth. Okay, The second man is a man from heaven. All right. So Jesus is from above. We are from below. We're going to hear in John's gospel. So take everything we've heard from the prologue and uh, we have to see a new creation happening here. Um, and it begins with a wedding feast. Uh, this first sign of our Lord is put there very deliberately and strategically by John. Uh, to signal this uh, for us in this chronology of seven days. So we got a new Eve in the Blessed Mother, and we got a new Adam in our Lord present at this wedding feast. Um, now, Sabbath as a marriage to God, uh, something we got to take seriously and look at. Uh, so I want to look with you at... Uh, so what the Jews say about this whole thing. So we got to go back to um, <clears throat> Exodus now and this marriage that took place. I mean, that's the way the prophets see it, as a marriage that took place at Mount Sinai. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so he, uh, In Exodus 20, verse 8, is where it says, when he's issuing this, these ten words, um, <clears throat> what we know as the Decalogue, okay? It says here in verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay, what's interesting is the word holy, Kadesh. The Jews understand that word as meaning both holy, sacred, or consecrated, keeping something sacred or holy, but it also has this connotation of betrothal, spousal, nuptial, marital uh, dimension to that word. Okay, um, that's what we got to see. So I did a little looking around, um, and I see, I uh, found a Jewish uh, site that uh, I read this article entitled The Jewish Betrothal, the Kiddushin, okay, from that word Kadesh, all right, that's being used in Exodus 28. Keep the Sabbath holy, okay. Um, now, again, you recall what I already told you is that uh, in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, there, you know, uh, there's this Jewish sense that... Um, that intimacy, that primordial kind of intimacy, 
original intimacy with God was like a marital relationship that they enjoyed with their creator, uh, symbolized by the Sabbath rest, okay, um, <clears throat> or betrothal in a certain sense with Almighty God. So this article now, I'm going to quote to you. Uh, so Rabbi David Abu Dharam, a medieval liturgical commentator, said the following, when we recite in our prayers, God who sanctifies us, we may interpret it, God who married us. For the Hebrew root of both sanctified and married is Kadesh. Cool, huh? The Talmud, continuing here, the Talmud, okay, which is like kind of a Jewish catechism in a certain sense, the Talmud uses two terms for betrothal, okay, and one of them being Kadesh. What is the meaning of this rabbinical term, sanctify or betroth, okay, Kadesh? Uh, it means that the man forbids his wife to all other males, so kind of consecrates, makes her sacred, sanctifies her, but betroths her. You see how those senses of the word are intertwined, these two senses. Uh, so this is um, not something I could find in the Old Testament. When I looked, I, I looked up every instance of Kadesh, and I could not find one that had that sense of betrothal. But... Um, but it's in the Talmud. It was, uh, you know, that's the way the rabbis uh, use in rabbinical Hebrew. Uh, apparently, the word has that meaning. Uh, so that's how they interpret both Exodus 20, verse 8, keep the Sabbath day holy, uh, and also Genesis chapter 2, that sense of the Sabbath. as like a marriage to God <coughs> is what's being signified there. Now, there's a great biblical scripture scholar, uh, Catholic, and uh, he's fantastic. I just ordered his, his um, doctoral dissertation. It costs a lot of money, but uh, I can't wait to get it. Uh, he, uh, his name is Gary Villanueva. And uh, in an article entitled Divine Marriage, um, he's an expert on this whole nuptial dimension of the Old Testament. He says the following, the nuptial covenant between God and Israel was not instituted on Mount Sinai. Okay. But merely recalled for it had already been sealed at creation. The obligation to keep the Sabbath given to Israel at Sinai rests upon the original betrothal made at the dawn of history. That means the whole human race in Adam and Eve, all the nations, both Jew and Gentile, okay, everybody. So there's a certain universal nature to this betrothal that is very profound uh, to reflect upon, all right. Um, so now, let's talk about the third day. Uh, when he begins this chapter that way, on the third day, okay, um, we can look at a couple of different things. We can look at Exodus chapter 19 again. And what we see is when this marriage takes place at Sinai, okay, um, three times uh, God is going to say, uh, be ready by the third day, verse 11. Be ready by the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. It's like the bridegroom coming uh, to marry his bride on Mount Sinai. And he said to the people, Be ready by the third day. And on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and thick cloud upon the mountain, a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Um, so this is incredible to think of, uh, we got to get that nice and clear because it's clear in the prophets that there's this marital spousal nuptial dimension to what happened at Sinai. Key that we get that. Okay. 
And um, notice that repetition of on the third day, on the third day, on the third day. So here we have at the beginning of John's gospel, the great theologian, John, the eagle, okay? Um, this is not happenstance that he says on the third day. So he wants to evoke that in our minds uh, when we hear that on the third day. This becomes part of uh, the whole belief in the resurrection um, that was passed down that we hear recorded in 1 Corinthians 15. This is the uh, kind of a creedal statement here, a doctrinal creedal statement that uh, Paul is sharing with us at the beginning of chapter 15, a whole chapter dedicated to the resurrection, but it begins with this doctrinal formula, kind of like a dogmatic statement that he signals for us when he says, um, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Okay, so... This uh, way of speaking, Paul is signaling here uh, that he's paradidomai, that he's uh, handing on to us something that he first received. In other words, a creedal formula, formulaic statement about the essence of what we believe as Christians, part of which is that he was raised on the third day. Our Lord being raised on the third day. So, when we hear the third day, we can't help also but think of the resurrection. All right. So on the third day is uh, highly significant at the outset of chapter 2. Now, let's move on. And I want to uh, just talk about signs in general because this is the first of his signs. So we should just mention something at the end of this chapter. Uh, I mean, of this pericope or, you know, whatever this episode of the wedding feast of Cana, he's going to say this was the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee. He manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So signs and glory, those are two very important themes in John's gospel. As a matter of fact, you can summarize his whole gospel that way. Chapters 1 through 12 is the book of signs. Chapters 13 to 21 is the book of glory. So what are all these signs then? Uh, well, there's a total of seven of them in John's gospel. And <coughs> the first one's right here, Cana. Transformation of water into wine. Then we're going to have the official son in ch end of chapter 4. Then uh, the healing of this official son. And then the healing of a paralytic. And then the transformation of the loaves and the fish. Or, or not transformation, multiplication of the loaves and the fish. Okay, the blind man receiving his sight. Uh, then you have in chapter 11, Lazarus, the raising of Lazarus. And finally, the resurrection. All right, uh, so those are the seven signs. We're just uh, on the first one. So you can see the number. numbers are very important for John. So uh, now... Signs are also important. His use of that word sign is something that was also used in reference to these wonders or miraculous deeds that Moses did. Okay, And in the Septuagint Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's the very same word, semion. Okay? So um, <laughs> in all the instances I'm about to relate to you, uh, you're going to hear about signs. Now, John loves this word to describe miracles. Signs point to something else. All right. So there's something mysterious and in a deep interior dimension uh, to these events um, that point beyond themselves to something else. Moses performed signs. There are other words used in John and the synoptics to describe the miraculous. Dunamis is the most popular mighty deeds. Okay, teros is another word that's used sometimes. Wonders, okay. Um, but they also use, you know, like even in the synoptics, you hear about the sign of Jonah, okay. Uh, so sign is also another word that is used. 17 times it's found in John. 
and about 60 times elsewhere in the New Testament. Uh, but uh, let's now look and see how it's used in the Old Testament to describe Moses. We're going to start first with chapter 14 of the book of Numbers after uh, the spies went in to check out the land, scope it out. They come back with an ill report, you know. They, uh, they kind of uh, made the people afraid uh, to go up. And except for Joshua and Caleb, they were the only ones who said, no, 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 we got this, we can take them, okay? Uh, but every, these others came back, and after spying out the land, they were like, they disheartened the people. And this really upset the Lord, so there was a lack of faith. And uh, so the Lord is mad, and Moses stands in the breach, like he always does, and intercedes and mediates, and uh, he, he, he calms God down, um, but then listen to the words of Almighty God here. Then the Lord said in verse 20, chapter 14, verse 20. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. But truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. None of the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I wrought in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the proof these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice. Okay. Um, Moses performed signs, or God, we should say, performed signs through him. So now we can look at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And here we have set the stage here. Uh, Moses just laid hands on Joshua and appointed him as his successor in the sight of all of Israel. And everybody says, okay, we will obey Joshua. So they acknowledge and recognize uh, that Joshua is his legitimately appointed successor. Um, and yet Joshua is not going to be the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18. If we go back to Deuteronomy 18, okay, Moses says there's going to be a prophet like me that will come one day. In other words, a prophet who will perform the kind of signs that Moses performed, all right? So who's that going to be? I mean, who in the world is going to be a prophet like Moses? Uh, um, well, our Lord is. Absolutely eclipses the signs that Moses performed. Our Lord is the prophet like Moses. He is the fulfillment of that prophecy of Deuteronomy 18. Um, now, more about that as we get into John's Gospel. We'll see examples of that. But uh, let's look at this text here. Chapter 34, verse 10 of the book of Deuteronomy. There has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. And for all the mighty power and all the great and terrible deeds which Moses wrought in the sight of all Israel. All right. Um, well, our Lord's going to be performing signs. Very interesting. Turning water into blood. Well, at least the blood of the grape. Moses' first sign is transforming uh, the water into blood. Okay, turning the river into blood, uh, the Nile River. That was the first of his signs. And our Lord is, uh, if we borrow that poetic image or metaphor uh, that we find throughout the Old Testament, numerous places, uh, the blood of the grape. Okay, so our Lord's first miracle is to turn water into wine. The blood of the grape, just as Moses' first sign was turning the river Nile into blood. All right, uh, so lots of uh, connections to Moses. Now, anything else I want to say about that? That's good for now. Let's move on. Let's talk about the significance of Jesus being at a wedding. What's he doing there in the first place? Uh, interesting. You know, what is he doing there? I mean, it says that the mother of Jesus... She was invited, and then as an afterthought, you know, it seems like uh, Jesus is invited. But uh, it says the mother of Jesus was there. 
Jesus also was invited along with his disciples. All right. Um, but I think he was just there because the Blessed Mother was there. She must be related somehow or friends uh, with the bride or uh, with the groom. Uh, at least that's what the fathers, some of the fathers of the church surmise from this, starting with Chrysostom. St. John Chrysostom, 4th century doctor of the church, says, Assuredly, they who had invited him had not formed a proper judgment of him, nor did they invite him as some great one, but merely as an ordinary acquaintance. Thomas, St. Thomas Aquinas says, Mary's mention first to indicate that Jesus was still unknown and not invited to the wedding as a famous person, but merely as one acquaintance among others. For as they invited the mother, so also her son. But at least they invited him. Got to make sure to invite Jesus to our weddings. Uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church here is going to say, on the th uh, paragraph 16, 13, on the threshold of his public life, Jesus performs his first sign at his mother's request during a wedding feast. The church attaches great importance to Jesus' presence at the wedding at Cana. She sees in it the confirmation of the goodness of marriage and the proclamation that thenceforth marriage will be an efficacious sign of Christ's presence. Now, what drives priests up the wall is couples who come in and want to get married in a gazebo. It's like, what? It just uh, shows uh, uh, incredible ignorance of the faith, uh, of reality. Ultimately, the Son of God came down here. Our heavenly bridegroom laid his life down for his bride, the church, to save the whole human race, the most romantic act ever in the history of the human race, in human history. The central saving event. Okay, and it's romantic. It's supreme romance. Oh, it's so romantic. We want to get married in a gazebo. The most romantic place you can possibly get married is in front of that altar. At the foot of the cross. Where the most romantic thing ever happened in the history of the human race. Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know anything about salvation history? How he's laying his life down for his bride. And then inviting us to share his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Okay, in a one flesh holy communion with God. Okay, which the Eucharist symbolizes. It's the great symbol of this marriage. The consummation of this marriage. Anticipating the heavenly wedding feast of the Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper. We should say wedding supper of the Lamb. All right. Awesome. Can't think of another context. If you have two Catholics, what in the world would you want to get married at a gazebo for? Okay. Uh, you would, if you have any formation in the faith, you know that the only place that you'd ever want to get married is in the context of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. In front of that altar drives priests up the wall, and they come in all the time, you know, and it's always her that does the talking, and he's sitting next to her on the couch, and I know what's coming, you know. Uh, they start saying, uh, you know, maybe they've tried the gazebo thing, and, and they, you know, didn't, that didn't fly. Um, like, now nah, we don't do uh, marriages outside the church. Uh, so then she says, well, um, do we have to, uh, she always looks for reassurance to her fiancé. I always notice that. So she, there I am. And she's like, um, do we have to have, uh, like the whole, um, the whole ceremony? I mean, do, all the, um, prayers, like the, uh, you know, the, um, the rituals and prayers that you, you know, you, uh, do we have to do all of that? Or I just sit there patiently listening to this whole thing. And I'm like, uh, finally I rescue her and say, um, do you mean the holy sacrifice of the mass? So, so often they just want to do a simple, uh, marriage liturgy and, uh, they want to skip over the prayers and rituals. Um, 
So it's really amazing there, but for the grace of God, go I. Thankfully, I just had a better formation in the faith along the way. Family I was raised in, and thank God I, I caught this whole thing. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I just, I feel sorry for them. That's all. I just feel incredibly sorry for them because uh, they're incredibly deprived, and I do everything I can to try to enlighten them about this whole thing. Um, but, uh, you know, a marriage um, that's a civil marriage, you know, it's, uh, it's a marriage, but it's, it's like the wine. Uh, a sacramental marriage is when you invite the Lord to the marriage, and it elevates it to the, to the level of a sacrament. A sacrament is a channel of grace instituted by Christ to confer grace. Okay, so grace is now flowing into that marriage. Because the wine of human love is going to run out eventually. Uh, St. John Paul II said a couple will stare the love out of each other's eyes. Uh, something else has to kick in, that divine love. When uh, an earthly marriage is um, framed in that context or built on that foundation of the heavenly mystical marriage of each one of the spouses to Christ first and them as a couple, uh, in their, if they're living that prior marriage, that foundational uh, and primary marriage to Christ, the mystical marriage between Christ and the church, if they're really living that to the full, it's going to empower their earthly marriage to succeed. It's going to, life and grace is going to just flow into uh, that earthly marriage. Real grace. So we got to invite Jesus to the wedding, okay? And the Blessed Mother. We're both present there. All right, I got it out of my system. Now, anything else here? Um... Let's move on. I want to talk about this word, who's stereo. Who's stereo is like failed. The wine failed. Womp, womp, womp. Okay, the wine failed at the wedding. And curiously, it's the bridegroom's responsibility to make sure the wine does not fail. Uh, but the bridegroom and the bride are never mentioned by name because they're not of primary importance. Mary and Jesus are. The new Eve and the new Adam. Or uh, <clears throat> that's the real marriage that's taking place here is uh, Christ Jesus as the heavenly bridegroom and Mary as kind of a representative of the church in a certain sense. You know, um, there's another marriage taking place here in the whole Gospel of John. And uh, that's absolutely eclipses this earthly marriage. But this beautiful couple, you know, a real living human couple in Cana, that got married at that precise time and place, had Mary and Jesus present at their wedding. Can you believe that? It's just awesome. And uh, and then our Lord pour, performs this miracle at their wedding? Now that's a memorable wedding. When the Son of God, the heavenly bridegroom, transforms water into wine at your wedding, that's pretty awesome. All right, now... The wine failed, and uh, so here our Lord is the true bridegroom, and he's the one that actually ensures that there is wine at that wedding. That earthly, uh, unnamed bridegroom was supposed to uphold his responsibility, his duty in that regard, and he failed. So the wine failed. We fail. Husteria. Who's stereo? Okay, so, uh, you know, I liken this to Romans 3.23. Uh, St. Paul says, All have fallen short. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay, same word. Fallen short, failed. Okay, uh, all of us. Who's stereo? All of us have sinned and fallen short, failed of the glory of God. Uh, fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are in this state. So that earthly bridegroom, you know, he's really a representative, symbolic of every single one of us. Uh, we all fall short. And, uh, but God wants to glorify us. So, boy, 
No one knew it probably except the servants what had happened. The wedding guests had no idea. They were probably uh, singing the praises of that earthly bridegroom, you know. Um, but uh, behind it was our Lord. Um, but our Lord's going to glorify us. He wants to glorify all of us. And that will be to his greater glory when he glorifies us. Uh, he really wants to glorify us. Um, we see this... Uh, even though we've fallen short of the glory of God, he wants to glorify us. You know where we see this is in Isaiah. Isaiah's love Isaiah. So here we hear about this, this messianic banquet. This time of eschatological fulfillment here in chapter 55. Everyone who thirsts come to the water. Okay. Come buy wine and milk. Um... And uh, if you're thirsty, if you're hungry, come here. This great feast, this great banquet. And uh, then listen to this. Behold, you shall call nations that know you not. You see this uh, movement now of evangelization in the new covenant that's going to embrace all the nations now. This um Taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Listen to this. Behold, you shall call nations that you know not. Verse 5. And nations that knew you not shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel. For he has glorified you. Wow. Isaiah. Isaiah is so deep. And listen to this. More descriptions of this worldwide evangelization in chapter 60 verses 8 and 9. Uh, I'll go up to verse 7. Uh, they shall come up with acceptance on my altar. It's amazing. All these pagan kings are going to bring gold, frankincense. Gold and frankincense. Uh, this is usually linked to the uh, infancy narrative in Matthew. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> in verse uh, 6 here. So uh, these pagan nations are going to be your sons and daughters. Kings are going to come to you. This amazing chapter 60 here. Um, more of this description. Uh, uh, and I will glorify my glorious house. And, and who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves to their windows? For the coastlands shall wait for me. The ships of Tarshish. To bring your sons from afar. Their silver and gold with them. For the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. Awesome. Um, this is really uh, powerful. All I can think of is St. Paul when I hear about the coastlands waiting for this proclamation of the gospel, of this good news, of this new covenant is going to reach out to all the nations. The coastlands like of the Mediterranean world and all the islands St. Paul is going to travel to. Uh, all of this is uh, being prefigured or prophetically announced. And ultimately, he has glorified you. I will glorify you. God wants to glorify us. I just wanted to look at that in the Old Testament first. Now, uh, let's just flip through a couple things in the New. And uh, yeah, we may fall short of the glory of God, but he's going to make up the difference. Listen to this. This is uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 2. Uh, through him, we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand and which we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Chapter 8, verse 30. Um, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified incredible chapter 9 verses 22 to 24 um, what if God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power has endured with much patience the vessels of wrath made for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for the glo vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory this is all about the Gentiles being brought into the covenant. Okay, these vessels of wrath. 
now have become vessels of mercy. And uh, what for what? For glory, ultimately. Uh, anything else I want to look at? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Back to that chapter 15 again. Let's go to verse 43 here. 42 and 43. Talking about the resurrection. So, so is it with the resurrection, so is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable, what is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. Sown in dishonor, fallen short. And it's going to be raised in glory, folks. It's going to be raised in glory. Um, so think of that as you're reading this uh, passage ultimately god wants to glorify us and here's another incredible verse here from uh second corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the lord are being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another 417 for this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all all comparison. Uh, last couple more, couple more. Colossians one twenty seven. The glory of the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Wow. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He wants to glorify. When we fall short. Revelation 21, 10, and 11. Uh, this is the description of the new Jerusalem here. And uh, might as well go take it all the way through to Revelation here. What do we see? And in the spirit, the angel shows John in this vision the new Jerusalem. Listen to this. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Perfect way to wrap up this little reflection on glory, huh? Um, in the context of the wedding feast of Cana, where's this whole thing going anyway to that wedding feast of the Lamb? Listen to this. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And in the Spirit, he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. The glory of God. All right, so anyway... We all fall short of the glory of God, but God is going to glorify us. Now let's talk here about the woman. She is the gune, okay? This is the Greek word for woman. And uh, the Blessed Mother I spoke of in Genesis 3.15. She is that woman that was prophetically uh, announced. Uh, it's not Eve, okay? But it's the new Eve, okay? The Blessed Mother is this new Eve. She is this woman, so when our Lord says woman, dresses her as woman, uh, that, that's striking. I mean, on one hand, there's nothing unusual about addressing a someone who's not your mother as a woman that in antiquity at this time, uh, that was a term of respect. Uh, it sounds weird in English. You don't go around saying, woman, get over here. You just picture some guy his wife beat her t-shirt, you know. Um, but no woman, I mean, our Lord addresses the Samaritan woman at the well as woman in chapter four. He's going to address the woman caught in adultery as woman. He's going to address Mary Magdalene as woman. Okay. So it's, it's not necessarily a, a rude way to address a woman. All right. Now, um, uh, but what's so unique here is that uh, you don't have any cases anywhere that you can find uh, in antiquity of a, a son calling his mother woman. So our Lord, when he addresses her in this way, does so in a very mysterious fashion. Um, he's signaling for us that she is this gune. Uh, Genesis 3.15, she is the woman who has an enmity with the devil. She is this new Eve. Um, so we got to see that. And I think the best thing uh, we can do is 
read a couple quotes in the Catechism at this point. This is uh, some of the fathers and doctors of the church. St. Irenaeus says this, Being obedient, she became the cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. And the Catechism continues that hence not a few of the early fathers gladly assert, and here's another quote from St. Irenaeus, the knot of Eve's disobedience was untied by Mary's obedience. The knot of Eve's disobedience was untied by Mary's obedience. What the Virgin Eve bound through her disbelief, Mary loosened by her faith. So she is the gune of Genesis 3.15. She is the new Eve. Comparing her with Eve, they call Mary the mother of the living. And frequently they claim, and this is uh, St. Epiph Epiphanius, a theologian of the early church, and death through Eve, life through Mary. Um, so, Mary's importance here in John's gospel is huge. She's going to disappear for a long time and pop up at the end in chapter 19 at the crucifixion there. She's at the foot of the cross. And what is our Lord? How does he address her there? Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Okay? So, um, once again, she's going to be referred to as woman. She's never addressed as Mary in this gospel, which is so interesting. Um... So, anything else to say about that right now? Let's let that go. So, our Lord's now uh, going to have this little dialogue with her, you know, because she's come to him and said, hey, they have no wine. The wine has run out. The wine has failed. They've fallen short. Um, what are you going to do? You know, there's something implied there. You know, there's an implication. It's like uh, implications, placare, to fold, okay? And the prepositional prefix in or im in this case. Implicare to, you know, something's folded in. Uh, and uh, folded into the thing, into that question. You know, she's, uh, it's not lost on her or our Lord, all this profound uh, Old Testament and... Uh, you know, salvation history context to what's happening here. So there's lots of indications we'll look at later in the next time, you know, about how wine is uh, an indicator of a messianic age. And this messianic time is going to uh, bring wine in great abundance so that it's going to run down the hills. Uh, like in the prophet Amos chapter 9. All right, we're going to look at these types of things. But uh, the grand equation of things, our Lord knows who he is, that he's the heavenly bridegroom. And the blessed mother and he both, they know the implications. So when she comes to him and says this, he makes this interesting uh, remark. What have you to do with me, woman? Uh, it sounds kind of harsh in English, uh, but look, um, this is a common Semitic expression that we can find examples of in the Old Testament. I mean, it's literally, what to me and to you, woman. It's a very odd, sounds very strange in English, but it's found in the Old Testament. I was struck by how many times, how many places it appeared, at least five or six different places, and there's a couple I thought we could look at just for fun. So let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 13, and look at a, an instance of this. This is the great prophet Elisha. Elisha is the successor of Elijah. Remember when Elijah went up in the chariot of fire? Okay, he dropped his mantle, passed his mantle to Elisha. Okay, this dual ministry uh, is prophetic and prefigures, foreshadows the dual ministry of Jesus and John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is this new Elijah. He came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And Elijah was prophetically foretold to come before the Messiah. Okay, And then Jesus is like the prophet Elisha, who performed even greater miracles than Elijah did, since he received the double portion 
of the blessing of Elijah before he uh, was taken up. Um, so this is Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha in chapter 3 of 2 Kings here. So let's pick it up in verse 13. And uh, Elisha, he's, he doesn't like the king of Israel. He doesn't have a whole lot of respect for him because he's very duplicitous. And uh, loosey-goosey with his worship practices. And Elisha said to the king of Israel, the king of Israel wants him to perform some kind of work miracle or, you know, something to help them in their upcoming battle, you know, a uh, campaign. So he's coming to Elisha. And I like, Elisha says to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? It's the same expression. What have I to do with you? And he says, go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. Um... But anyway, there's this back and forth dialogue between the king of Israel of the northern kingdom of Israel, okay? This is after the kingdoms have divided. you got the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. And uh, for the sake of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah in the south, Elisha says, because of the king of Judah and in my respect or high regard, my regard for him, I'll help you out. If not for him, I would neither look at you nor see you. Um, but now, um, the power of the Lord came upon him, and you know, eventually he performs this miracle. And uh, this is a light thing in the sight of the Lord, he, he later says. Okay, so look, Elisha um, you know, starts this dialogue with that interesting question. Elisha, who interestingly enough, is kind of prefigures our Lord himself as the successor of St. John the Baptist, this prophet, you know, uh, like Elijah, in the spirit and power of Elijah. So he, uh, he eventually concedes to the request, okay? Um, that's what's, uh, it's just interesting to see the use of that expression. I want to look at one more with you, Second Chronicles chapter 35, verse 21. Now, yeah, here we just have this Egyptian king, Nico, and he's having a dialogue with the king of Judah, Josiah. And he doesn't want anything to do with Josiah. He's not there to fight Josiah. He's just trying to get up there. You know, he's got some other battles to fight with the Syrians or something, I forget. And uh, so, yeah, he's just passing through. And I don't know, Josiah wants to pick a fight with him or something. And... Uh, it's interesting. But he says the same thing to Josiah, the king. He says, what have, you, what have we to do with each other? Interesting. Um, so he's not saying it in a way that's adversarial, quite the opposite. He's saying, look, I, I you know, what do you want from me? You know, um, I'm not uh, looking for trouble with you. Um, so anyway, uh, what else can I say about that? Let's leave that alone here. Our Lord says, my hour has not yet come. Okay. Um, so he basically tells her no to what she's implying. But what a strange way to interpret this to say that Mary is now going to disobey his express intention. He does not wish to do this miracle. He's made that explicitly clear. He says, no. What is this to do with you or me? My hour has not yet come. That seems pretty definitive, I suppose, on the face of it when you're hearing it in English. Uh, but then the Blessed Mother, seemingly against his will, the one who is so obedient, whose faith unloosens the knot, or whose obedience loosens the knot of the first Eve's disobedience, this obedient Blessed Mother who is full of grace, and entirely the handmaid of the Lord, okay? The maid servant of the Lord, um, totally guileless and innocent, immaculate in every way, is now going to go against his express wishes and calls the servants over and says, do whatever he tells you. Some people might say that, you know, 
heard Protestants try to make this argument, but, you know, the counter-argument uh, is pretty strong, too. Well, if really she's being disobedient and pushy, pushing her will into this situation, being this controlling Jewish mother, uh, well, our Lord complies. So is he being disobedient? Is he complicit, folded in with uh, her disobedience? Because he caves to her wishes. So you have two people who are immaculate. One by nature, our Lord. The other by grace, the Blessed Mother. Okay, neither one of them. That is such a superficial, shallow way of reading this text. That is not the way to read this text. Um, but there is something interesting here that the Blessed Mother takes the initiative in this. And it's like our Lord allows her to do it. Some kind of communication is going on uh, between them. Uh, that's way over our heads. Uh, but they were on the same wavelength. And they saw all the context. And there's a spiritual discernment that two people who, have, who do not have the static on the brain that the rest of us uh, have as a result of our darkened intellects. Uh, these are two pure souls. Um, the two pure souls that ever walked the face of the earth. Um, and we just can't imagine this new Adam and Eve. They work together here in this instance uh, to perform this miracle. Um, our Lord, the Blessed Mother interceded. First she intercedes with her son. She's a go-between. That's what an intercessor is. Chado, chadere, chessy, chessus. Chado or chadere, okay, is this word to, uh, to go. In Latin, one of the words to go and uh, to recess, to process, to access, okay, uh, to go. Um, and, and then you uh, tack on this prepositional prefix inter in the midst of or among or between, okay. So somebody who goes between, a go-between, uh, that's what an intercessor is. The Blessed Mother is an intercessor here. On the one hand, she's going to her son, uh, and on the other hand, she's exhorting the servants, do whatever he tells you. It's so neat. Um, I like what St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas says here. He says, you know, to say do whatever he tells you, uh, the phrase is not fittingly said except of God alone, for man is able to err at times. So it's so interesting. She turns to them and says, do whatever he tells you. But first he's going to say, look, my hour has not yet come. It's interesting because it could presume that there's some correlation here between the wine and his hour. Presumably the Eucharist, you know, the Last Supper um, is what's being indicated here. Um... For our Lord to say that seems like he's catching her drift, you know. My hour has not yet come. He knows that what she's implying has to do with his hour. And his hour is going to involve ultimately the establishment of the Eucharist, I think, is the most plausible explanation for what he's, what's, what's the subtext here uh, going on. Uh, maybe that's what it is. Uh, let's read the Catechism on this. 2618. And see what it says. Uh, the Gospel reveals to us how Mary prays and intercedes in faith. At Cana, the mother of Jesus, asks her son for the needs of a wedding feast. This is the sign of another feast. That of the wedding feast of the Lamb where he gives his body and blood at the request of the church, his bride. It is at the hour of the new covenant at the foot of the cross that Mary is heard as the woman, the new Eve, the true mother of all the living. Wow. I mean, we can think of John chapter 6, you know, uh, and think as we're hearing him say that, my hour is not yet come. 
if this is really what's being spoken of in the subtext is the Eucharist, uh, that would make sense considering what our Lord's going to say in his Eucharistic discourse in John chapter 6. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him, the one flesh union between Christ and the church. Um, oh, all right, so profound. All right, now... Um, 17 times John's going to refer to his to this hour, okay? Just like he uses the word samion or sign 17 times. Also, 17 times you hear this hour being referenced here. And uh, there's a historical and a liturgical sense to this. Um, you know, let's talk about the liturgical sense. I mean... What our Lord is really coming to do, and this is what we got to understand when we look at the whole wedding feast of Cana at large, is our Lord's coming not to abolish, but to fulfill. I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Matthew 5, 17, in the Sermon on the Mount, that's what our Lord says, and that's really what we see here in the wedding feast of Cana. You see the new covenant and the old covenant. So when you hear the water, think Old Covenant. When you hear wine, think New Covenant. Okay? And this wine, so superior to that mere water, it's going to uh, supersede, surpass, fulfill uh, that water. Uh, and it's going to make that water come alive. So, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, when it talks about the Scriptures, see if I can find this place where it talks about the Old Testament. And it says that... Uh, uh, now i got to find it. Hold on. Uh, uh, the New Testament. The New Testament, or this wine, lies hidden in the water, in the Old. The New Testament lies hidden in the Old Testament. It's in there... But until you turn to the Lord, as St. Paul's going to say in 1 Corinthians, okay, when a person, 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians? Uh, St. Paul's going to say that, though. You have to turn to the Lord, 2 Corinthians. Uh, and then, it's like the veil is removed, and you suddenly see the Old Testament come off the page. When a person turns to the Lord, you have this transformation of water into wine. That Old Testament text is like water until you turn to the Lord. And then when you turn to the Lord, your heart is set on fire like the apostles or like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, okay? He opened their mind to the understanding of the scriptures, of the power of the Holy Spirit. And this New Testament lens, you turn and shine that back on the Old Testament and that water is transformed into wine awesome. The, old, the New Testament lies hidden in the Old, and the Old Testament is unveiled in the New. This is an expression used or formulaic way of describing this relationship or dynamic between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Old Testament, New Testament. St. Augustine coined that expression. Yeah. Anyway, um, so... We're running out of time, but I want to get to a stopping point a little further along here. So I am actually going to push on just a little bit over an hour. It's probably going to take me an hour and 20 minutes to get through this. Sorry, but I just want to um, I want to try to wrap up the whole uh, chapter 2 in two classes. Uh, so I'm just trying to push a little bit here. So let's take a deep breath, get a drink of water, and um, I'll take one. Let's press on a little bit more here. Uh, 
Uh, let's see. So I wanted to say that this hour now, this hour, this this liturgical renewal that's going to take place, this transformation of water into wine. Old Covenant revolves around the temple. Temple sacrifices of animals. Isn't it so interesting? The New Covenant is going to dispense with all that. All that's gone. So that's kind of indicated by the second half. You know, the next part of uh, chapter 2 we're going to get into next time is this cleansing of the temple kind of signals that transformation of water into wine. Animal sacrifices are going to cease we heard about that prophetically described in the book of Daniel, okay? In chapter 9, this incredibly important chapter, where you have the arch, archangel, archangel Gabriel describing this vision, providing this vision of the future to the prophet Daniel, where he tells him that uh, in 470 years from the moment this is incredible. Uh, I don't know if I want to get into this whole thing. But he says in 470 years or 70 weeks of years, okay? Uh, from the moment the decree goes out to send the Israelites, the Jews, back to restore the temple. When they are sent back. We know when that happens. The Persian king Artaxerxes uh, sends them back. And we can read about that in Ezra chapter 7, verses 11 to 28. Okay, and we can pinpoint that through biblical and extra biblical sources. Okay, we know right about 457, right around 457 BC. Okay, a decree was written uh, sending the Israelites back, and that's when in Daniel chapter 9, the archangel Gabriel told him, Start the clock ticking 470 years from that decree going out uh, something amazing is going to happen. An anointed one is going to come to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity. I'm not making this up. And an anointed one is going to come and guess what? He's going to be cut off. That's another way of saying he's going to be executed. An anointed one is going to be executed um, and the city is going to be destroyed and um, he will make a strong covenant with many, and then um, he shall cause sacrifice and offering to cease. Wow. Isn't that unbelievable? Uh, chapter 9, the book of Daniel. Amazing. The prophecy of the 70 weeks of years, the 470 years. It's a, prof it's a powerful, powerful motive of credibility. Uh, to help one come to faith in Christianity when you read that because clearly Christians did not write that. And when you subtract 470 from 457 B.C. and you count backwards, you know, or forwards 470 years like your archangel Gabriel tells Daniel to do, guess where you wind up? 33 A.D. Okay? Not making this up. Forgiveness of sins. Atonement for all iniquity. An anointed one who's going to be put to death. The temple's going to be destroyed. And this anointed one is going to make a covenant with many. And all, and he will stop all animal sacrifices. Uh, so there's a displacement here. This new covenant is going to usher in a new style of worship. In the next couple chapters from now, when he's talking to the Samaritan woman, he kind of indicates this when he tells her, when she's asking about, you know, which mountain, we don't know what mountain to worship on. You got your mountain, you know, we're Samaritans, we got our mountain. And uh, which mountain is it? And then our Lord says something very mysterious to her, indicating the new covenant, the entrance of the new covenant. He says, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such the Father seeks to worship Him. Um, anyway, uh, very interesting here. Uh, so this cleansing of the temple is very, very interesting. 
indicative of this this shift liturgically uh, that's going to take place from the old covenant to the new covenant. The new covenant sacrifice is a unbloody one. Okay, it's the unbloody sacrifice that uh, Malachi spoke about in chapter 1 of the prophet Malachi. He says famously, For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations. And in every place, incense is offered to my name. In every place, not just in Jerusalem. In every place, incense is offered to my name. And a pure offering for my name is great among the nations. A pure offering. Okay, this is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. That's going to be offered from the rising of the sun to its setting. Our Lord's name is going to be great among the nations. In every place, incense is going to be offered. And a pure offering, for my name is great among the nations. Okay, uh, I don't want to go too far afield here, but we need to just get real clear on what's happening in John's Gospel. What he sees. A man writing this thing who's celebrated the sacraments now for decades... And he's deep into this whole mystery. The great theologian, the great eagle. Okay, winding down here. Um, I, uh, you know, we could look at Psalm 50, verse 14. We could look at Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. You know, where you see kind of like prophetic prefigurements of this displacement. Or at least of God's intention, ultimately, to do away with animal sacrifice at some point. He clearly indicates in these two particular psalms, Psalm 40 and Psalm 50, uh, that, uh, you know, he doesn't need any of these sacrifices. It's not like the pagan gods. It's almost like a concession to human and custom and so forth to allow us to do this for a period of time. He kind of like concedes to it, uh, this human um, kind of instinct. Uh, but ultimately, he doesn't need any of that stuff. If he's hungry, he wouldn't tell us. Okay. Um, ultimately, this New Testament sacrifice of the Eucharist is what God really wants. Read Psalm 50 and you'll get that. Uh, you want to make God happy? Offer him a sacrifice of thanksgiving. A sacrifice of praise. Uh, the Most Holy Eucharist. All right, now uh, let's uh, just talk about a couple more things. Do whatever he tells you. I mentioned the Blessed Mother said that. These are her final words. She's not going to say anything else. That's it. Genesis 49.11, it's just interesting because that's what, uh, not 49.11, Genesis uh, 41.55. It's the words of Pharaoh. You know, at the time of this famine, it's just interesting. Go to Joseph. Do whatever he says, whatever he says to you to do, do it. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, the Blessed Mother, when she says this, you can connect it to a couple things. You can connect it to that, Pharaoh and Joseph. Joseph, who's going to do what? He's going to feed the nations, okay, with this grain reserves that he's kept up. And uh, because he, for, yeah, it's, it's cool. And all the earth came to Joseph to buy grain. All right, uh, the, the prime minister of Egypt. But I love these words of Pharaoh to all the Egyptians. Go to Joseph. Ite ad Yosef. Go to Joseph. What he says, what he says to you, do. Okay? So it's like the Blessed Mother turns, says, hey, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Just do it. All right? So it's interesting also because the people of Israel... At the great wedding feast, remember, of Exodus 19, um, when they get married, okay, on their wedding day, what do they say? All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. It's very interesting. The Blessed Mother says, do whatever he tells you. Again, on the third day, on the third day, on the third day, on the third day, Exodus 19. This wedding that took place on the third day at Mount Sinai. Now, fast forward to the wedding feast of Cana on the third day. 
And what did the people say at Mount Sinai on their wedding day? They said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. What does the Blessed Mother say at the wedding feast of Cana? Do whatever he tells you. Um, so cool. We can also look ahead a little bit at uh, Exodus 24, verse 3. Once again, they repeat this very same thing. Uh, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord. And the people respond, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. And they repeat it again in verse 11 here. Um, I think, hold on, verse 7. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. So, it's just interesting uh, that you have this whole thing, uh, this all this interconnectivity. So Mary's an a intercessor. Now let's talk about the stone jars and we're almost done. Hang in there. Six stone jars. You know, 20 to 30 gallons a piece. Unbelievable. Uh, so it's either 120 to 180 gallons, man. How many people are at this thing? You ever drank a gallon of wine? I tried to when I was a freshman at a family get-together. My Uncle Sam's. He's on the other side now. Hopefully we can have a big laugh about this someday on the other side. But I wasn't laughing that night. Uh, I was a freshman in high school. And I didn't know. I was just, uh, I wanted to see what it was like to be intoxicated. Anybody ever done this? So I was bored out of my mind at this family get together. And for some reason I thought wine wasn't that uh, strong. You know, I didn't know anything about alcohol. I'd never had alcohol before. So I wanted to see what it felt like. So I went in the kitchen. No one's in there. And there was a gallon of some cheap wine. Gallo or something, you know, big green bottle. Uh, I started chugging it, you know. I chugged a bunch of it because uh, I wanted to see what it felt like. And I didn't feel anything right away. So I was like, I wasn't sure how much to drink, you know. I mean, it tasted like, you know, vinegary grape juice. I, I didn't know what the alcohol content of wine was. You know where this is going. All right. Uh, hey, I didn't even drink a whole gallon. I don't know. I tried to maybe, but I drank a good bit. I drank a good bit. I guzzled a whole bunch of this stuff as an experiment. And I got so wasted. All I know is my mom sent me out to the car to, with a package to put in the trunk. And I couldn't get the key in the trunk. And I don't have many memories after that. I threw up numerous times. Uh, missed school the next day. My parents didn't really punish me much for that. But uh, the family joked about that for years. I would get uh, kidding remarks. Uh, but uh, hey, live and learn. You know, um, so I didn't drink a whole gallon of wine. But I mean, how many people were at this wedding, man? 100, 100 and 120, 180 people. Imagine a gallon per person. I mean, this is an extraordinary amount of wine. All right. Extraordinary amount of wine. It's just awesome. Um, how God is just, he thinks big. He thinks big and he also thinks small. Um, all right. So, you know, six stone jars we could connect that with Numbers 19. Numbers 19 is interesting because it talks about the ritual of purification when you touch a dead body. And what's so interesting, it says uh, it prescribes what you're to do on the third and seventh day. Does that have anything to do with the wedding feast of Cana? Third and seventh day. If you touch a dead body. Uh, you're to go through these ritual baths with water and you use a hyssop. You take hyssop and dip it in the water and you sprinkle it upon things that need to be uh, purified. It's pretty interesting if you wanted to read uh, Numbers chapter 19 verses 11 to 22. 11 to the end. Uh, it's just kind of cool to read about. But notice the repetition of Third and seventh day, and a uh, person's going to be unclean for seven days. So, 
anyway, that could have something to do with these, uh, you know, these <laughs> six stone jars. Wow. Um, Augustine says, when he turns water into wine, he shows us that the old scripture also is from himself. For at his own command were the water pots filled. It is from the Lord, indeed. It is from the Lord indeed that the old scripture also is. But it has no taste unless Christ is understood therein. Back to that statement of St. Augustine. The old is unveiled with the new. It comes alive. It has flavor. It has taste. The water becomes wine. That's what St. Augustine's getting at here. But what's so interesting here is he also acknowledges that our Lord instructed them to top those jars off Top those jars off with water first. And that water that he, he doesn't just make the wine out of nothing. That's interesting. He doesn't just perform this miracle ex nihilo out of nothing. Just snap of his fingers. Uh, no, he transforms water into wine. And that's part of the sign value. Okay. That what's being signaled for us here, signed, pointed to, okay, is this transformation of the old covenant into the new. So he didn't just want a wine to appear. He wanted to transform the water into the wine. And he made the water. The water came from him too. The old covenant, the old testament came from our Lord. He's behind that. That's what's kind of cool about this quote from St. Augustine. He turns the water into wine. He shows us that the Old Testament scripture, he calls it the Old Scripture. The Old Testament also is from him. For at his own command were the water pots filled. St. Thomas Aquinas says, Christ made the wine from water and not from nothing in order to show that he was not laying down an entirely new doctrine and rejecting the old, but was fulfilling the old. All right, Augustine sees, yeah, I don't know if I want to go into that. Yeah, there's some interesting numerology that uh, Augustine gets into uh, with the six stone jars, you know. Uh, some of the fathers of the church get, uh, I think, a little, go a little overboard with some of the numerology. It would be just, uh, you know, modern scripture scholars would roll their eyes at some of the stuff. There, There is excess at times in some of this. So he goes on about the uh, symbolism behind, you know, uh, the six, that it's six stone jars. Whether there's meaning in that, I'm not quite sure, but it didn't convince me, okay? And also about the two or three uh, met, metrites, okay? That's the uh, Greek form of, like, metrics, okay? Uh, the, the Greek description of, of the, uh, the amount of uh, what was in there. It gets translated 20 or 30 gallons, but it's two or three of these metrites, okay? And he, he tries to make... Trinitarian analogies with that, and I, I'm just like, I don't know. There's a, sometimes I, I just don't uh, see it. All right, now, um, Gamizo. Uh, what was that word? Luke fourteen twenty three. Let me check one thing here. Luke fourteen twenty three. Um. Yeah. I like this word gemizo because it's like, you know, he wanted those things topped off. He wanted them filled up. It's that, it's that gratuitous generosity of God. You know, he wants it filled all the way. He's not going to skimp. You know, he's not skimpy. He's uh, super generous, you know, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing in our lap. 120 to 180 gallons of good wine. Incredible. But I love that. The word gemizo is like this, the full. He's, you know, he says, fill them to the brim. 
okay? All the way. And the same word is used here when it's like, again, it's this description of this feast, this, this great banquet. This man gives a great banquet. And uh, this parable in Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. And uh, it's like the master said to the servant, go to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled to the brim. You know, I love that generosity of the heart of God. Um, lastly, I think I already mentioned the first miracle of Moses was to turn water into blood. Now our Lord is turning water into wine, which is the blood of the grape. You can look at different things if you want. You can see examples of the use of this poetic metaphor in the Old Testament. Genesis 49, 11, Deuteronomy 32, 14, Sirach 39, 26, 1 Maccabees 6, 34. All right, we went a little long. Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll hit it again next time, folks. God bless you.